morning with me. Um, we'll definitely try to make this entertaining and educational, um, but really it's going to be up to you guys to kind of give me some feedback and tell me what you want. So really what we're here to talk about is prepping poultry for the fair. Whether it's county fair or state fair, we're going to be pretty consistent about what we're talking about here. So first off, I want you to know who I am. So my name is Jordan Jones Hager. I am a volunteer. <laughs> volunteer, let's remember that. I'm not an APA judge, which is the American Poultry Association. I am not a vet. These are things that I've learned through poultry showing and being a superintendent and being involved in fairs and doing research. Some of these are opinions, um, but I do want to, I will justify my opinions with everyone. Um, every show I go to, I listen and I learn. I mean, that's really what you do. Every time you go, you talk to people, you ask people. Talking to judges is a great way to learn things. I am involved in the poultry community. I am an NPIP breeder, which means my birds do get tested and I have to follow certain biosecurity standards. I'm also a member of the Iowa Poultry Association and on their youth engagement committee. But again, I am not a judge. I'm an event planner, really. Is kind of <laughs> but I love chickens, so I'm known for my way with chickens. Um, this is my contact information. Feel free to write it down. I am happy to answer questions via email, via phone. We also have a Facebook page. This is specific for Polk County. However, all the information is applicable to the state fair as well. A lot of the material you see today is available on that Facebook page. Today, we're going to discuss several different things. A lot of questions about the state fair, poultry show, or general poultry questions overall. This is my information. The only thing I will make a request, I cannot rehome every rooster. <laughs> I get requests to rehome roosters from track supply from everyone. So, um, so anyways, guys, I am here to help in any way that I can, but with roosters probably I can. So, this is my contact information. Today, we're going to discuss a lot of different topics. The first thing I need everyone to understand and we're going to go through is how judges are evaluating birds, what those judges are looking for so you can help get your birds in the best condition possible. Steps that you can take to condition your bird, and conditioning means getting it in the best physical and mental state of state to be at a show. Steps you can take to make your bird present itself in the best way possible, and then how to prepare for showing, which is something that's how you involve or work with your bird. Our format for today meeting, questions are encouraged. You guys are here to make this what you want. I'm happy to answer questions. I am not going to answer brief specific questions, such as, I have this one bird that has a missing lacing feather on its primary or on the swing. I'm not here for that because I'm not an APA judge. This is very broad information about improving the quality of your bird. Specifically, if you have questions on a breed standard, this is your go to book right here. This is the standard of perfection. This is a book that gets updated every couple years and it has pictures. But don't just go by the picture because this is one artist's interpretation of what that bird should look like. You need to read what the actual standard for that bird is. More importantly, the beginning of this book explains so many general guidelines and general information. Don't ignore it. Start the SOP by reading the front portion of this book. Good news about the SOP is there is a new version coming out next year. Rumor has it, it's going to be a digital copy. So instead of a hard copy book, you'll actually be able to get a digital version of it, which means when there's updates, it'll go right in there. So that's exciting. However, it doesn't change the whole thing. Lot. So getting an older version, you're still going to get a lot of the same good information. Um, we are going to use live birds today. The uh, Iowa State volunteer let us use the bird, but with any live animal, things can happen. So just be aware of that. So any questions on the general introduction or how are things going to go today? Yes. I like this picture. Okay, perfect. So the first area we're going to start with is really about the judge's perspective. We're going to understand what that judge is looking for and what it matters. Um, I, again, I am not a judge. 
I have clerked for several judges, typically APA judges. I have taken classes on introduction to judging, but I am not a judge. But when it comes to the judge's opinion, how the word evaluated, there's three areas. This is their ranking and what's most important, the confirmation of the bird. Confirmation is the structure of the bird and how it's built. Color is next important, lastly followed by condition. Build, color, condition. These are the three C's that the judge is really going to be looking at. When it comes to the reality of judging, the bird has 15 to 30 seconds to make an impression on that judge. That bird can be sitting in that cage and look perfect, have the perfect pose, be exactly what it needs to be. Doesn't matter if the judge is in front of it. So please be aware that is part of it. It's how that bird has that 15 to 30 seconds to really show off for that judge. Um, judges follow a general scale of points. You can have a bird that has a perfect head, but if it's got a disqualification or if it has loses points on other areas in the bodies, that kind of all averages out. So sometimes we do have people that are like, well, this bird is the exact right color, right? But it's got a split wing or it's got a disqualification. It's got something different. So the judges use the scale. It's important to get familiar with the scale. So when you are picking your own birds, you know what area has the most weight behind it. So this information is literally a picture right from the standard of perfection. So again, everything you need is right there. Symmetry, balance. Is the bird well balanced? Is one side the same as the other really? Weight and size, is it appropriate? Now, the hard thing about weight and size is that poultry tends to go in extremes. They generally like to see large birds bigger and small birds smaller. So that's just something to be aware of. Now, again, it can still, you can still be a DQ if it's too big or too small, but there is some variation in there. Condition and vigor, the comb, the beak, just kind of understand how all these things are important. So the comb is more important than the beak. But at the same time, if you've got a bird that's got a frost bit comb, so you're going to lose some points there, but has a great back, you're still ahead of the game. So just get familiar with this list because this is a list that's really going to help you understand how your bird is scored. Confirmation or shape. Understand the standards for your breed. Again, it's all right in here. We're not going to go in depth into breed, a lot of different breeds. You need to understand how the birds are scored, okay? We've done that, I've shown you that. You cannot change confirmation. Confirmation is genetics. It's the genetic material that bird's made up of. So here's the thing, and this is always a hard thing to describe. Genetics are gonna get your bird so far. And your bird's never gonna be better than it can be. But conditioning helps that bird get to its maximum potential. So you can't change a bird that has a short back, but you can help condition and get everything else in good shape so that you're kind of raising the bar of your bird. Confirmation isn't something you just look at. It's something you have to feel. Poultry is a very hands-on thing. We're gonna get some hands-on some birds today, but it's something you have to touch and feel. Wider is better. This is something that I think sometimes people forget a little bit. Nowhere in the book, does it describe narrow as a good trait? Wider is generally better when it comes to breeding birds. We're gonna go into that a little bit more in depth. I'll give some examples. <laughs> when we're talking about production classes, our broiler classes and our layer classes, uniformity is the most important thing, which means how similar those birds are to each other. So if you've got one bird that's really wide and two birds that are or five birds that are average and one that is really thin, you'll be better off to pick those three birds in that middle range because they're more like each other. You don't wanna go for extremes when it's, when it's a production class. You wanna go for that uniformity. We'll get to a stopping point in a minute. Okay, any questions on what I've said? Okay, again, ask questions, guys. Someone put together this great list of breeds, giving examples of what's a utility or a hatchery bird and a show quality bird. Now, some things I wanna kind of touch on first off. 
hatchery birds are still really good birds, guys. I don't want to make you think because your bird comes from a hatchery, it's a bad bird. That's not true at all. Murray McMurray Hatchery up in Webster City was just, I think they had four flocks APA certified. Um, you'll have APA judges flat out tell you, if you go to a hatchery, go to Murray McMurray. It's 90 miles that way, 45 miles. I don't even know how far it is. It's not that far, it's that way. But they consistently have great birds. Um, some birds are more common as show birds than other breeds. Cochins. You can find a lot of show cochins out there. So this is an example of more of that show cochin. And again, we talked about extremes when it comes to bird showing birds sometimes. Bigger cushion. This bird has a bigger, rounder hind end than this bird. But it's also got smaller combs. So again, one thing's bigger, one thing's smaller. It's just how, the, it's what somebody decided they wanted the bird to look like. Here's a Seabright. So same thing. Here's more of a hatchery quality. Here's more of a show quality. If you are new to showing, stick with something simply colored. A judge is gonna evaluate every single laced feather here. You have to get every single feather with lacing. That's complicated genetics. If you had a solid blackbird, you're good <laughs> for the most part. So this is a beautiful bird, but it's not necessarily what I would recommend for someone starting out to start with. Start with something a little simpler. But again, you can look at the shape of these birds. Short back here is what you really want with this. This bird has a longer breath. This is smoother curved lines. I do find show birds are much more graceful. They're not kind of abrupt in their changes. Wind up. Uh, you've got some great white wind up breeders here in the state. Um, and guess what? They're not that much more expensive than hatchery birds. Mm -hmm. But again, white wind dots are an easier bird to show. So a couple things to be aware of. So here's just some examples. These are large fowl, not bantam though. Again, smoother lines. Everything is much more sleek on this bird. It's much more rounded. Combs are generally smaller and things like that. Um, legs, um, again, they have kind of a nice color to them. You guys know me, Polish are really not my favorite. <laughs> I don't think Polish would survive without like constant human care. Um, but again, you have a good example here of a hatchery style bird versus a show bird. Longer lines, sleeker lines on this bird, um, generally, all Polish I've seen have, have some coloring when it's a white crested Polish up here, but it's minimal. Um, again, it's kind of those just extremes, those things to keep an eye on. So really good examples of the difference in the birds. So we mentioned width earlier, and width is definitely something that is never described as, you never want narrow. It's really never described in the book as narrow. The wider the head of the bird, generally the wider the whole body. Wider head, wider heart girth, that width should really stay throughout most of that body. It's, it's not gonna kind of go like this, it's gonna stay wide. <laughs> so when they call the width of the body, um, pins with a wider body, a wider heart girth, are going to generally produce more than anything else. Can I get that rooster? Okay. So give me just a second, guys, we're gonna get that. Uh, we're going to get a rooster to kind of show uh, some of the width. Sorry, it happens. Um, and we're going to kind of talk about that. Uh, we'll go ahead and show some differences. So here's three buff, or sorry, light Brahma bantams. These are from three different breeders. They're actually all really good breeders, but three different lines. You can't really tell the width difference too much on these birds. You can tell the length, but you can't tell the width. Well, let's look at the heads of the first and the last bird. Here you can act, or sorry, this is the first bird, this is the last bird in that picture. You see here the width of that bird's head, and that actually follows him through the whole rest of it. So, when we talk about heart girth and feeling, you're kind of feeling here behind the wings. You're feeling how wide this bird is here, and it generally, as wide as he is here, is going to follow him all the way back down. So, this is not, I would say this is not a particularly wide bird, but just kind of gives you that example of the shape here. There we go. Kind of that width right here is kind of what you're seeing. So when we're talking heart girth, this is the area that we're going to talk about for width and then head as well. So, but these are just some examples 
Um, again, you've got to get your hands on the bird. Looking at these birds from the side, you can't tell much of a difference. But I did show these individual birds to a judge. One, two, three was how I ranked them. And this one, while he's shorter than this bird in length, is incredibly wide. And that was the judge was like, the wider is harder. And go for the wide bird. So he's now a primary breeder. I'm just going to hold this one for a little bit. Okay, color. Question. Why, why do the birds need to be wider? So the birds need to be wider because basically a person decided that's what they wanted. Showing <laughs> birds is really about somebody's idea of the perfect bird. Perfect bird doesn't exist. There's always something that can be tweaked and improved upon. But somebody came up with a list and said, these are the characteristics this perfect bird needs to have. It's a standard that everybody in showing is trying to obtain. Now, wider birds can produce more, so that is a benefit, and maybe that's why they wanted that bird to be that way. Color, when it comes to a bird, we're not gonna get into coloring a whole heck of a lot, guys. Um, you have to ask yourself, is it a recognized color of the bird? There's a lot of really pretty colors out there, guys. It doesn't mean they're actually recognized. If they're not recognized, you generally can still get a purple ribbon, but you're generally not pulled for higher than that. Um, simple versus complicated colors. Make sure you understand what the bird should be and what you can do to modify a color. <gasps> not much. If you actually are modifying a color, it's kind of cheating. Um, uh, we don't dye birds. We don't uh, mark birds with pins. Uh, we don't really can't do much to alter the color. We can do things to bring out the natural color and bring out the luster and sheen of that bird. But we're not really changing the color. I know we all feel this way when someone says that our chickens are beautiful. It's just a moment of glowing pride that we have. <laughs> so conditioning more on this to come because this is something you control. You can't control the genetics. You can't do much to control the color but you have complete control over conditioning of that bird. Any questions on what I just covered? And just remember guys, this is what the judges are looking for. Questions, questions? Yes, Celine. Why do the judges only look for this thing? Is that all they look at or what else? Well, the only other thing a judge is really gonna look at, which is not 100%, a judge isn't going to look fondly on a bird that pecks them. So <laughs> handling that bird is part of conditioning. Um, but really, that's the bird is, that's what the birds, you know, someone decided that's what the birds are supposed to be. So that's what we look for. Let me get back to the talk to talk you guys. Okay, so this was our, this is going to be our longest section real quick. So this is again what you have control over. This is the conditioning part. This is the getting your bird ready to show. Some general topics that we're going to just discuss real quick. The longer a hen is laying, the paler her comb gets. Generally, for showing, we like a nice bright red comb. And we can do things to bring out the shine, but we can't change the color. So just be aware of that. The longer a hen is laying, generally the paler she's going to get. White birds exposed to sunlight turn yellow and it doesn't wash off. You have to let the birds molt to get rid of that. They kind of get this grassy sheen to them. And you can tell, guys, even a spotlessly clean bird, you can tell that bird's been in a lot of sun. So I made that mistake. Turned out all my light brahmas, they turned all grassy on me because they were outside. So if you're going to show a white bird, keep it in shade. Don't let it get a lot of direct sun. It can take months to really condition a bird. We don't have months, so we're going to really focus on some of the stuff that we really can do. Um, check for mites. If you have mites at a show or parasites, you are generally sent home. But here's the thing about mites, guys. They're super easy to treat. If you're going to look for mites, what you're basically going to look for is you're going to find bare skin on the bird, typically under the wings or around the vent area. You're looking for tiny little red things that are crawling around. Well, there's a couple things you could do to get rid of those mites. Um, birds try to keep themselves clean by having dust baths. That dust getting on them and them shaking it off knocks the mites off of them um, or gets the mites off of them. If they don't have access to a dust bath, you can give them a, give them a normal bath with dish soap. 
Now, this soap is not ideal for getting a bird ready for show, but it works very effectively for getting rid of skin parasites. Other things you look for are scaly leg mites. Those are mites that get under the skin of the bird's legs and kind of cause them to curl up a little bit. Those do not drink blood, so they actually have to be killed topically. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do, but basically the mites need to be suffocated, so the birds need to be have their legs covered with something that's gonna suffocate the mites and promote healing. Um, so there's just a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, Vaseline typically works pretty well. Um, some people say gasoline. I don't know if I want to put gas on my bird. Um, I use uh, A and D diaper ointment. Helps really promote healing, but it suffocates those birds or suffocates those mites. Um, so just you've got to look at that because if you've got scaly leg mites, it's going to take some time for that bird to heal. Same thing if you've got a lot of mites on a bird, it's going to take time for that bird to get in condition. Those skin mites are sucking the nutrients from that bird, so it's not going to be in good physical as good physical condition. Check your mites. Check for mites and check often is really what it is. Um, remove spurs. So we are going to have a little demonstration on this, guys. There is, again, a lot of different ways people do to remove spurs on a bird. There is a method where people take a hot potato, shove the hot potato on the spur, let it sit there for a little bit, and then the spur falls off. Do you want to stick your finger in a hot potato? No. If you don't know how hot that potato is, you could be damaging your bird. The nice thing is it doesn't bleed, but it doesn't bleed because you kind of you, you burn the bird, in my opinion. So it's not a method I like to do. I like to do the good old fashioned way with pliers. So I'm going to flat out tell you this is going to bleed a little bit. Um, the bird will be slightly uncomfortable for a couple days just because it's got a little bit of a sore. It's really nice, though, if you have an aggressive rooster because he'll leave his girls alone and things like that. Um, why we despur a rooster is because these spurs cut our hens. They damage our hens. Hens will get open sores here. Feel free to pass this one around, guys. It's sharp. This was from a little basil rooster. This is from a different breed. But here's the thing is, spurs are hollow. There's a little bone that grows off the bird's leg, and this is basically like fingernail material that grows over the top. When we remove spurs, they're gonna grow right back, but it takes a couple weeks. If you despur a rooster, you wanna do it six weeks or more before a show. I'll use quick stuff. Um, so basically, <laughs> get your fear over there. Um, I generally do sit down for when I'm doing this, just so oops, it doesn't roll. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my pliers. I'm gonna put them low on this bird low on the spur, and I am just going to gently rock back and forth. I'm not cranking as hard as I can. I've just got a little bit of motion back and forth, okay? And this might take a little bit of time. I'm basically loosening this spur from the actual bone. And a little bit firmer each time I go. But again, I'm not ripping it off. I'm not forcing it. You'll see it's getting a little bit red towards the bottom. It's starting to give a little bit. If I press too hard, this spur will start to crumble. I'm trying to keep it whole. Again, I'm getting a little bit more motion to it. I'm holding the bird's leg. I'm not just holding the thigh, I'm holding this, the whole bone. Again, it takes a minute. Here we go. And it just cracks loose. Now suddenly I've got a lot more motion and the whole thing pops off. And that's all there is to it. Now again, you can see there's some blood. We're not dripping blood, we're not losing blood. We just have a little bit of blood. I have some quick stop here, which does sting a little bit. But I'm done. That's it. This bird's gonna be more comfortable. The hens around this bird are going to be more comfortable. I've seen birds at the state fair that can't walk because their spurs are so long. So this is just some basic husbandry that I have noticed coming to state fair um, that I just wanted to kind of address and show people. Again, you can go on YouTube and there's a potato method, but I'm telling you why I don't like the potato method. Um, 
this bird's not happy with me, <laughs> but he's not screaming out in pain. He's not fighting. I'm going to do this other one real quick, though, guys, just to make sure he's kind of nice and balanced. Don't want to leave him lopsided. Those players have like a blade on. They have a little bit of a grip. Okay. Um, no blade, just uh, they're just snap on oh. little pliers. So I mean, they're nothing. These are literally grabbed out of my husband's toolkit, guys. <laughs> he, every time they disappear, he's like, oh, "I know what you were doing again." <laughs> but again, I'm just rocking it back and forth, and eventually, I'll feel a give. Again, I'm adding a little bit more pressure. There we go. Popped it off. There it is. You guys keep them and make a necklace out. I mean, seriously, they're like, here's your next like Halloween idea. You get a nice, you get a little like Tarzan necklace out. And then I've dipped and he's done. And see, he is bleeding a little bit, but we haven't dripped a single drop of blood here, guys. So this bird's gonna go up for us. Uh, um, don't um, like chickens, like don't they go after red? They can, but he's gonna pin myself. So good, a good, actually very good comment. Um, was he so was he so calm because he's been working with it or just how you were holding him controlling him? How I held him. So basically you can take any chicken like that, the way you're holding by the feet, they'll be docile like Correct. that. Correct. And we'll go through that because that's actually a show and ship hold. Um, and that's why we use that specific hold for show and ship is because you truly have control over the bird when you hold the body like that. Yeah, bring all that in. Let's do the layer. Nails next. So that was just a real quick demonstration, guys, and it didn't take me that long. Maybe once a year, every six months is really how we do that. But it's something just to kind of be aware of. You can do your birds. Um, we're bringing out another different bird. I'm going to trim some nails and beaks with. Um, these are all teaching birds. So the bird you just saw is actually a retired breeder from Murray McMurray that was donated here to the facility as a teaching bird. Um, this facility, real quick, was built about a year ago. You can look through the windows, and, and you will have time for this afterwards, where you can actually see examples of commercial laying. Um, there's more of the, a cage-style laying in here. Uh, the, the eggs from this facility actually do go into human production or human consumption. Um, so she's just going to grab me another bird, and we're going to do nails. Because if you have any other type of livestock with hooves and horns, you guys know you can't just trim it once and be done. You've got to work that quick back if it gets long. Um, so same thing with nails. So this is a bird for laying. Um, she's not the prettiest. Her, again, her, this bird's job right here is for laying. But because she's in a cage, she does tend to get these longer nails. Okay? She's not on dirt. Because guess what? Most people don't want to eat food that comes from a dirty environment. So these cages really help them keep them clean. But we can trim her nails to make her comfortable. And this is something that a show bird should definitely have done. Just like um, anything else with your cats and dogs, there's a quick, just like with that spur, there's, there's a, um, a blood vessel in there. When you trim, you don't want to just go, oh, I want her nail to end up here. I want her nail to end up there, but that's not where, where we're going to start. We're basically just going to trim a little bit at a time and try to avoid blood. You can see the pink here. And if you trim a little bit at a time, you can generally avoid seeing any blood there. I do like having a quick stop around, even though I don't have to go before, <laughs> because it's a great way to stop the bleeding. Um, since this is kind of like a straw, it has to clot from the inside. It's not like skin, but it'll kind of come together a little bit easier. So super easy to trim nails. You have to sweep them in here. But it's going to make your bird a little bit more, more comfortable. Also, is anybody showing pigeons in the county or state fair? Do you guys know pigeons are a new category now at the state fair? No. Um, one of the nice things about how your bird stands is if a bird has long nails, it's rocked back. It's not going to have that nice straight stance. So this is why having those short nails is important in showmanship because it's like leaning back all the time with that long nails. When you can actually stand much more erect when you've got those short nails. Um, I also do like using a Dremel when it comes to um, trimming nails. It kind of gives them a nicer finish than just a blunt finish. I'm using cat trimmers right now, guys. 
I mean, that's really all I'm doing, but I've just taken enough off. With the spur earlier, you said you could use flour instead of quick step. Will yes. that work on this as well? Flour would work instead of quick step, yes. Okay. What was that? Corn starches, Corn yeah. Corn starch works well too. Okay. But basically, guys, I've given this bird just a little bit shorter nail so that she can stand a little bit differently. Did you mention Dremel? Yes, I like using a Dremel. Just like an electric. Correct. It's like a cutoff wheel? Yeah. Um, it's, if you go to a nail salon, it's the same thing they're using. It's basically just a little thing that spins real fast. You can, when I use clippers, that nail is blunt. A chicken nail is not naturally blunt, it's pointed. So I can use that Dremel to not only get it short, but give it a nice, smoother edge. So it looks more like a natural edge on a bird um, versus just that blunt cut off edge that I would get. So, so um, again, this is not a bird that's been handled a whole lot. We are gonna get into like more of the showmanship hold, um, but really if you've got crazy bird, you get it in showmanship hold, you've got control of that bird generally. So since she's smaller, I'll kind of show you just real quick. I've got my finger between her middle legs and I've got her legs kind of scooted up here deep in my palm as I can. And I'm applying just a little bit of pressure. I do try to get above her knees. Her keel or her breastbone is sitting right in the palm of my hand. Here, I'm kind of making a V. If she's flapping and crazy, I could very easily take the edge of those wings with my pinky and thumb and hold her. She's not gonna flap, she's not gonna fight. She's comfortable. If I even adjust this position a little bit or suddenly I'm further down, she's not as steady. If she's not steady, if she's not confident, she's gonna be flopping and trying to balance herself out. But if you've got that bird in that hold, she's gonna be pretty comfortable. So same thing when it comes to beaks. Um, these birds' beaks have been blunted. Um, but one of the nice things is that sometimes when we feed our birds nice soft food, nice ground food, the beak doesn't get worn down. Same thing, you can use clippers. You will treat it like a nail. You can see where there's a blood supply and that clear tip is what you want to take off. Again, you could use uh, toenail trimmers, but I do recommend kind of a Dremel to give it a nice round. Why, is there a, um, why are the birds using spotless? Well, like the, um, coats and things. That's just how she bred. Let she's a leghorn, and leghorns have these big red cones. Sometimes, all these people assume big red cone, it's got to be a rooster. No, nope, this is all girl right here. But that's just how that bird's bred. Yes. Sorry. Can, okay. Can some roosters be bred to be spurless? Like ours doesn't have spurs. Um, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Oh. So, I do know. There are some spur guidelines in the SP. What breed is it? Uh, Colombian wine dot. Colombian wine dot. Um, let me consult the book after we're done, okay. and I'll let you know. So. I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, maybe he's, he's only a year. Yeah, yeah. still, they'll, they'll get a pretty quick. Okay. So more general notes real quick, guys. Like I mentioned earlier, your bird is only ever going to be so good based off the genetics it's got. Those genetics are a limiting factor. But these excellent foods, excellent environment is going to just basically help your bird to be the best that it can be. So excellent food, a healthy environment are really things your birds need to start getting into good condition. Now, unfortunately, there is no magic recipe I can give you a feed components that is going to give you that perfect bird because different birds have different dietary or dietary needs. When it comes to that, I highly recommend instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, use what scientists have given you. There is a ton of research on the existing layer feeds and commercial feeds out there. It's designed for your bird. Use it. Now that doesn't mean it's all you have to use, but it really should make up the bulk of that bird's diet. Layer class. They need extra calcium because they're going to be laying. Feed them layer feed as a base. Commercial class. Again, you want meat. They need more protein so they can put on that meat. Fresh, dry, mold-free food. Um, make sure your food is well balanced for your bird and don't overwhelm a bird with supplements. I've seen some people that feed their birds, fifth, what was it? One of the recipes I saw was 50% layer, 10% cotton seed, 10% um, flax seed, and the rest of it was sunflower seed. Um, that's a lot of stuff the bird might not really need. And you have to also calculate 
those different seeds have different proteins and calcium. So you could be really messing up with that bird's overall what it needs. So food is a science. <laughs> Trust the scientists when it comes to that. Supplements are good, but just don't, don't overwhelm them. When it comes to feed, pick your base. Your base is gonna be your layer feed, your, your broiler feed, your meat maker feed, your uh, all flock feed. Ooh, what was that? Oh, okay. <laughs> like, I don't know what that is. Um, you have options when it comes to feed, guys. You don't just have to go to Fleet Farm and Baumgars. Now, granted, they sell good food. I am not dissing their food. I am not saying they are not a great place to get food, but you do have other options. Heartland Co-op, you can actually go to and tell them exactly what on your food and they will make it for you by the ton. Um, so you definitely have options when it comes to your feed. You need to be careful using layer feeds with big roosters. Some people will argue this all day long to your blue in the face. However, there are college studies out there that will flat out show you layer feed has too much calcium for your large breed roosters and it causes heart problems. That's it. Um, so be careful using layer feed as a base if you're raising large breed roosters. Fermenting feed. I love fermenting feed, guys. I think fermenting feed is one of the best things out there. Fermenting feed is when you mix it with water and you let it sit for a couple days and stir it. So that way it starts actually getting broken down before the bird eats it and makes it totally digestible. Fermenting feed is one of the messiest things out there. So if you've got a bird you're trying to get ready for show and you're doing fermenting feed, you're going to have a sticky, stained mess to clean up for show. Also, fermenting feed doesn't do very well in summer, which is generally when we show. Um, make sure your birds have grit available. If you're trying to get your birds in the best flesh or body type possible, what you need to do is make sure they can digest it. And that grit helps grind up that feed so that they can digest more of it. I firmly believe you need to experiment with your feed so that you understand how that benefits the birds. It's not always the best time to do it right before a show. So we are going to kind of talk about some of the different additives you can use, um, but I just really want to make sure, you know, you've got to do it for yourself. Again, there is no magic recipe I can give you. Some of the additives um, that are recommended out there, sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds, especially the holes or the shells of them, have a lot of natural oils, so they can bring out shine in your birds. This is a trick pigeon, you use, pigeon breeders use or pigeon showers. Cracked corn is a great additive. It's not something I would really recommend feeding exclusively. Um, there is kind of a, there's stories out there that feeding cracked corn will yellow birds' legs. Birds' colored legs are determined by genetics. It's gonna be yellow or it's gonna be slate or it's gonna be a dark color based off the bird's genetics. I have chicks from a really good line that hatch with golden yellow legs. And I've got some others that got pale yellow, pale legs. They're fed the same thing. Um, but maybe it works a little bit up there. I just know it's not gonna magically change the color for you. Fish oil is a great thing to use for birds, just a little bit. Again, it's kind of that, nat brings out that natural oil and luster. Cotton seed is one that's used more and more. Flax, vitamin C and water. Um, super easy to do. You can basically just get human grade vitamin C, crush it up, put it in the water. They're gonna use what they're gonna use. If they don't use the rest of it, they just flush it out of their system. Um, but it kind of just promotes things. Avoid cat food. So cat food for a long time has been known as a cheap source of protein for your birds. The type of, and I will, this is, I, I should have double checked this, but it's, I believe it's the type of amino acids that birds need from protein are not the same that are found in cat food. They are getting some benefit, but they are not getting as much benefit as you actually think. In addition, if you're raising birds for broiler or layers, cat food isn't human great or isn't cleared for consumption. So now you're feeding birds something that isn't meant for other people to eat. So be aware of that. Rooster Booster is kind of an oil. It's full of vitamins. It's something that you can definitely add. Um, sprinkles. How are sprinkles used in getting birds in condition? Like I'm talking the Jimmy's, like rainbow sprinkles on your ice cream. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. 
I thought you were volunteering. <laughs> we put sprinkles in the broiler feed. Like they'll get bored eating their feet, so if you just put some sprinkles in there every once in a while, they'll be like, "Oh my gosh, what is this?" And then they'll eat, and it's like a magic way to get them to eat. It is. It Especially really is, guys. Hot and they don't want to eat. Yeah, they get bored. Who wants to have the same thing all day long? Throwing in some of those sunflower seeds, some of the crap corn, some of those sprinkles are going to encourage your birds to eat more. And if they need to be fleshier for competition, it's a great way to do it. Um, oil of oregano. So oregano does have some scientifically proven antibiotic um, properties. The dry stuff you cook with is not going to help your birds. Oil of oregano is the best form. Um, just to kind of throw in some food. Again, careful not to overdo it, but a little bit goes a long way with oil of oregano. Put that in Water. It's not something I've used, but water. It works water. really well if they have like rice. Yes. What, what ratio? I've done like two drops of rain oil to a gallon of water and mixed it. Um, yes, it does a lot. A lot of big hatcheries actually use this in yeah. their systems. So this is, while I'm not a big apple cider vinegar, dichotomous herb, this is one that's been proven. Um, vitamin B. Vitamin B gives you energy and makes you hungry. If I have a chick that's not doing well, I give them a dose of vitamin B, like that failure to thrive when they just haven't figured out eating. I'll give them a dose of vitamin B. It perks them up and makes them want to eat. Um, so vitamin B is something else out there that can be beneficial. Um, when it comes to specifics of this, protein is needed for growing muscles and also for feather growth. Um, that does not mean any protein will do. So you do have to make sure you're giving the right protein, which again, no cat food. Cat food is not designed for feeding poultry. Excellent sources. People actually will do a uh, meat maker feed. Again, if that's what it's designed for, it's a higher protein. Um, cooked eggs is another great way to kind of feed your birds back what they've used. Um, fish or fish meal. Sometimes people use fish skins. Um, again, it just, it's healthy. Sunflower seeds and with the holes, those can promote shiny coat or shiny feathers. Doesn't happen overnight. It's something you've got to give with time. Apple cider vinegar with mother. Mother's the chunks that floats around in apple cider vinegar. It has only been proven to have mild benefit as a digestive aid. I know sometimes in poultry they're like, oh, it's got respiratory, give it apple cider vinegar. Oh, it's got mites, give it apple cider vinegar. No, it is not the cure all. It is a digestive aid. Any questions on, on that real quick? Can I get that hint, please? The red yeah, the red hint. Okay, now we've got to talk about evaluating your bird. These are all great, but you have to know where you're starting and you have to know where you want to finish when it comes to conditioning your bird. The shape of the bird's breast is a great way to determine the overall fitness of the bird. So she's going to bring me out a bird here real quick. I'm going to show, show you a couple things with it. If anybody wants to stretch, take a moment and stretch. I know it's hard to sit here and listen to me talk for a long time. Okay. So this is a hen. So she's going to put some of her energy into laying eggs, which means she is generally going to be thinner or not have as much muscle as a male of the species. When we talk about the conditioning, Basically, the breast muscles are down here. When we, sorry, sorry, not holding her on my show because you pulled. Let me get her in a better position. When judges are feeling birds, one of the first things they do is they put their hand across this bird's breast. The bird's breastbone right here is called a keel. You should know that term. That keel is one I'm gonna line right here on the palm of my hand, right here across it. I put the center of my hand on that bone and I now have a shape in my hand. If it's a broiler, it's gonna be a flat shape because that bird's gonna have a lot of muscle, so it's gonna be straight out. If it's a U shape like this, the bird's probably still in really good condition and she is. When I put my hand on her, I'm making a U. She has breast muscles to keep my hand out. If she was thin like that layer, she's gonna make my hand make a V because she doesn't have much muscle, 
because all of her energy is going into being a layer. Even layers should still have some fleshing on them, okay? We want them to have some muscle. That means they're getting more than what they need and they have those reserves. So when you're evaluating your birds, guys, close your eyes. If you've ever seen a judge at the state fair evaluating broilers, their eyes are closed. They're not looking at that bird because they're not evaluating color. They're evaluating the muscle, which you have to feel. So when you're picking your, your commercial class, close your eyes. Go through and feel and go, okay, this is my normal. I put it on the next 10. Is it the same size? Is it wider? Is it smaller? This is gonna be the best place you can start with when it comes to picking out the birds you want for show. Um, so that's just really how you wanna start evaluating um, the birds when it comes to really their fullness. That's one of the best areas to just kind of, to evaluate. Any questions on that? Does anybody wanna feel? Anybody want to try it? Okay. What about your silkies? So just make sure again, guys, that you're getting kind of right here is where you're getting your hand, right in the middle. So, <laughs> conditioning is more than just how the bird looks, because guess what? You don't know your bird's got mites until you put your hands on them. This bird can look great, have beautiful feathers, and then suddenly you go to pick up this bird and it weighs nothing because it's had the mites, which have kind of sucked off the nutrition from the bird. Keep calm. We're covering a lot of different stuff, and there's a lot of information I'm throwing at you. Pick something that you want to improve upon each year and work on. That's really the goal. You're not gonna, you're not gonna have the perfect bird the first year out. It's something that we just always work for. Any questions before we continue on that? Questions, questions, Dan? <laughs> okay, okay. So next it really comes to housing, guys. So housing is important for our birds. Our birds need ventilation. They need fresh air. I know I talked earlier that our white birds don't need sun, <laughs> but if you lock that bird away in a closet where it's getting no light and nothing else, it's not going to thrive. Birds need light. Light patterns can affect the growth rate of your poultry. Your birds have a little part of their brain that age and do specific things each day. You can adjust those days in the perception of the bird's mind to grow faster, to get weight. There are things you can do to manipulate the birds. I did a study on this in high school. This was my science fair project. Um, I put three different layers. One had 24 hours of light, one had 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness, one had six hours of light, six hours of darkness. Which group started laying faster? Which ones matured first? They were the slowest. Are you answering? Okay, which ones? No, they were the middle. The six and six. Because their cycle was shorter, but more frequently, they were laying two weeks before any of the other birds were. Their brains thought they were older, okay? So be aware, housing is important. They need fresh air. They need energy. They need to be able to move and to build some of that muscle. Bedding should be changed before it smells. Do you know poop? If a bird sits in poop, it can burn through the bird's skin into the muscle. Do you want to eat a bird that's done that? Do you want to show a bird that's done that? No but it can happen guys. You have to keep that bedding clean. They don't have a choice where they are. You have a choice of what their environment is. Change the bedding. Birds tend to perish from being hot before they perish from being cold. It's true. Birds are gonna die when it's 90 degrees and they're out in the sun versus negative 20. They're like, yeah, whatever. Um, fans are a great thing. Sometimes people raise their birds in AC, which is great until you take them out of the AC. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You take this bird that's been an AC to the fair, it goes, oh my goodness. Question. What should 
if it let's say it's like in the 70s, what speech do you hear in the app? <laughs> Good question. Lots of variables there though, guys. So basically you just you want air moving. That's gonna be the big thing is the air moving around the bird is gonna help keep it cool. You know, slow fan's fine if it's just getting a gentle breeze, high fan if they need to be hot. Uh, one thing you can do, and this will be really interesting when you guys go to state fair or county fair, you can tell which broilers were in air conditioning because they don't lose their chick buds. It clings on to them longer. So a little trick there to just know. Um, dust is bad for birds. <laughs> dust is bad for us. So when it comes to dust, having that air exchange is very important. A lot of times birds can develop respiratory diseases, not always the big scary ones, just from being too much dust. Question? Why, why do chickens take dust medicine if it's bad for them? Good question. So, so why they 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 actually actually okay. <laughs> so that's my daughter, by the way. <laughs> Chickens take dust baths to get rid of mites because they get clean, but they don't live in the dust all day. They take their dust, they shake it all off, and then they go away from it. They don't live in it all day. So it's important to make sure we have air moving around our birds. Next thing is behavioral conditioning. So we've got them in great shape, so they look great. The bird's got lots of muscle on it. Its feathers are all nice because we've kept it apart from the others, so it hasn't gotten pecked on. And it's the biggest jerk you can possibly imagine. <laughs> no, what? <laughs> it's funny because I have two roosters that walk around at harness and leash at petting zoos, and they're like my little babies. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, yeah, it's too much time. <laughs> That's okay, because guess what, guys? You can tell the birds at a show that have been conditioned. Conditioned means they've actually also been put in that cage. Handling your bird. The more you handle a bird, the better it's going to be for showmanship. Now, I'm going to also flat out tell you, the handhold has a lot to do with it, but still, the comfort in being able to demonstrate the parts of that bird are going to come from you handling that bird. Um, same thing with a judge. A judge does not want to get pecked by your bird. Judge is not going to spend a lot of time on a bird that's, that's not showing itself. If you've been outside all day or your whole life, and suddenly you go into something that's over you, you're gonna crouch down. You're gonna make yourself smaller. That bird that's crunched down, hunkered down because he's uncomfortable in his environment is not going to show well. Condition your birds to enjoy being in a cage. Give them treats in that cage. Get them confident and comfortable in that cage. Get them used to being taken in and out of that cage. Get them used to eating and drinking in that cage. Takes a week. I mean, really put them in a cage. Just right before the fair, get them used to it, get them comfortable. That will help their demeanor and their presentation. Use the same bedding and for conditioning that you're going to use at the fair. Yes? Um, okay. so if we have, like, our birds, would it be easier to raise them in, like, a tote and then put them in a smaller cage before they go to the fair? The, so they can get used to it? It's a good question. The thing you have to be aware of is that birds need stimulation up here, too. If they're always in a cage, they get bored and they get mean. Um, so you still want them to be birds. You want them to interact with the flock. I love it. Guys, I take my young birds and they're my yard birds because they can be a bird. They can be out there. They can pet bugs. They can take dust baths. And then I pull them to get ready for a show if we're going to do that. But let them be birds. But you do run the chance of something getting damaged when you let them be birds. But just again, my flaws. But so anyways, condition the birds. Here's another little thing too that sometimes people do. This is more common in showing pigeons. People get a white coat. What do judges wear? White coat. They reward that bird every time it's around a white coat. That bird gets excited and happy to see that white coat. Doesn't care who's wearing the coat. Who cares about the coat? <laughs> this is something you can do. And guys, this is pigeons. I mean, it, this is done a lot more in pigeons. Um, you can do the same thing. Feed your bird in a white coat. It's not cheating. It's literally training your bird to give you the right response. I know everybody's laughing. Okay. <laughs> well, she she like, ah! Exactly. But the judge isn't going to do that. I know. I that. So we can put a white coat and do it. And there you go. Same response. Washing your birds. This kind of confuses me sometimes. Nobody takes any animal to the state fair except chickens every once in a while that aren't washed. Wash your birds, guys. Get them clean. Um, when it comes to washing your birds, everybody has a magic combination that works. Yeah, it depends. The trick is going to be 
get the dirt off the bird, but don't strip the natural oils. This is my go-to. So it's a sensitive shampoo, not gonna strip the oils of the bird, not gonna hurt the bird, not gonna change the color of the bird. There are some judges out there that swear they can see the green, blue, or orange of dish soap. Okay. I don't know, I can't see it. <laughs> Um, don't use anything too harsh on the bird, but you do want to get it clean. Um, check the ears. Sometimes people forget. Chickens do have internal ears. They get dirty. So make sure you kind of just flip back. Make sure there's no wax buildup or dirt buildup behind those ears. Give me a minute, okay, Delaney? Um, bottom of the feet. If your bird ends up with bumble feet, you, bumble foot, you can treat it. But sometimes it's not bumble foot. Sometimes it's just dirt packed in these little crevices. Get it out. Clean the bottom of your bird's feet. Again, we're going to use that nice, gentle shampoo, baby shampoo, horse shampoo. Quicksilver is designed specifically for white birds. Um, again, some judges swear. Quicksilver, where do you pick that up at? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked into it. Okay. Um, it's okay to let the soap sit on the birds. If you've got a dirty bird, like a broiler, a layer, or a turkey, let the soap sit on that bird for 30 minutes to an hour. Let it work and do its job before you rinse it off. It's okay to do that. And you might have to wash that bird several times, guys. I'll tell you that, that layer hen we had out, she was dingy. But if we washed her several times, she would be bright white. She's never been in the sun. That bird will wash up white. Um, make sure you rinse your bird very, very well. We don't want to leave irritants and things like that on the bird. When it comes to additional things that you can put on the bird, um, there's a lot of different schools of thought about this. The most common I have seen are white vinegar, not apple cider vinegar, and sometimes people use glycerin. This is a dip where you rinse your bird, it's clean, you have the glycerin or the apple cider vinegar, the birds are dipped into it, removed, and then dried from that point. Question, Delaney. Okay, so where do you know to wash on the bottom? So is there any place like, bad to wash? There is no bad place to wash as long as it's on the outside of the bird. If you're getting into your finer points, I use a toothbrush. Get those scales clean. Use an old toothbrush. Make sure you wash around the face. That doesn't mean we're gonna like absolutely inundate our bird's head with water. We're gonna avoid getting her wet, but use a cloth. Make sure we're getting clean around her eyes and her beak, her nose, her nostrils. Make sure that's all clean, guys. You want a clean, clean bird. Um, some people air dry their birds. Some people blow dry their birds. Oh, sorry. Um, this is my preferred air dryer. It is a pet dryer. It has lots of settings for temperature, so I'm not going to burn my bird. Honestly, guys, it's like 40 bucks on Amazon. It really wasn't that much. I don't finish drying my bird, but I don't like to put a sopping bird work. I like to get my birds mostly dry and then let them finish air drying. But this is what I use. You don't have to go spend a ton of money on this. Um, what was that? Just blow dryer. Dryer. Yeah. I know, but I like to be a little warm as I sit there shake on you. Um, Bluing is something else that people use on white birds to make them white. A little goes a long way, and it's much, much easier to get a blue bird than a bright white bird. So it's an option in, with caution. Um, wash your birds several days before the show. Okay? Don't, like, broilers generally get washed the day before because <laughs> they're nasty. Or the day of, in fact. But your, your general show birds, wash them a few days before the fair. Give them time because this bird is going to groom herself. And every little feather that maybe has a tear in it, she's going to try to fix. Give her time to fix those. Give her time to get herself back in order. So give her a couple days. But don't let her get dirty again, which means you are continually cleaning that bedding to make sure she's not laying in poop. Um, Day of the fair. So any questions on the things we're going to do? We're going to give our birds good housing with lots of ventilation. We're going to give our birds good feed with a variety of different supplements as additives. Yes, sorry. What kind of things do you suggest to people who are going to Well, we'll get to that. So, so then we've got our bird clean. Question, yes? Um, don't you, um, well, uh, um, you're supposed to, like, 
And about the fan part, it's just to keep, keep like the bird's nostrils like clean of gnats. That's the gnats. Right, early spring, we have something called buffalo gnats here. And buffalo gnats will overwhelm and kill your entire flock of birds with their tiny little bugs. So a fan will actually keep all the gnats off your birds. So absolutely good comment. Okay, day of the show, the show is here. Your bird's gonna poop on itself in the cage. It's just inevitable. Make sure you're prepared to get that cleaned up. Do not put powders or dichotomous earth on your bird. Your bird needs nothing. Don't put show sheen. Show sheen will actually weight the feathers down and cause dust to stick to your bird, making it look dingy. The bird's natural luster is all you really need. On legs and combs, you can use things such as VetRx. Basically, this is chicken mix. You can use coconut oil, Vaseline. A little goes a long, long, long way. But all it does is. Do you need to? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Now I got this. I don't mind. So, guys, literally. Perfect. Yes, good. I literally have enough to make my fingers slightly shiny. That's it. All I'm going to do is gently rub this on the bird. You can do it the day before, too. I like to do it right before. And all it's gonna do is make it a little bit shinier. Not a whole lot, but it's one of those nice finishing touches that you can bring out that natural shine of the bird. Same thing on the legs. Sometimes we'll use a little bit of oil or something on the legs just to make them shine. Stubs, you got wine dots? Avoid stubs. Three years ago, we had a kid that would have gotten our grand champion, had disqualification because of stubs. Stubs are feathers on the feet that shouldn't be there. They are teeny tiny little things. Before that bird goes in a cage, bring your twizzer, tweezers, just look at that bird's feet and remove any feathers that shouldn't be there. Stubs will get you every time. One of the last things you can do is, again, we didn't talk, we, you know, no show sheet. Silk cloth, which you can actually get really cheap. We're just talking a little square. Wiping your bird down with a silk cloth Will kind of remove the dust and just kind of bring a little bit of extra shine. So again, these are just little things you can do. You're again, nothing we've done has changed that bird's build. We have simply helped that bird be the best bird that it can be. Also, I birds are stressed. You guys think you're stressed? about this poor chicken. It is absolutely stressed at the show. So things like electrolytes are fantastic to use at the show after the bird's been judged. That is yellow and sticky. Why do we want to put yellow sticky things on our bird before it's been judged? So make sure you have it with you, but don't give it to your bird before the judge. Any questions on day of the fair? Um, different fairs work differently, guys. I kind of have my go-to kit. I like to have a food container that I can easily remove, so that way it is not obscuring the judge's view. I much prefer, this is my water. It's a little cup that I buy and screw onto the top of a Coke bottle. I can freeze this. This is gonna be nice cold water all day for this bird. Bird's not gonna poop in it. Bird's not gonna knock it over because it's gonna be attached to the side of the coop. Cost me a dollar. This is my preferred method of watering my birds at a fair or show. Um, have a little kit that you take things with you. Make sure you've got scissors or nail trimmers or extra things. Uh, wipe, baby wipes are great for cleaning up those last few little things. Next thing we are going to just kind of briefly discuss is conditioning versus cheating. So grooming and removing a stray feather is not cheating. You've got a white bird and it grew a black feather, pluck it. I mean, that's all it is. That, that's not cheating, guys. You've got a black bird that grew a white feather and you colored it with a marker, that is viewed as generally cheating. Oils to enhance your bird's shine, not cheating at all, that's general practice. If you find a bird that's maybe got a damaged wing and you take a moment to realign those feathers and get them back together, not cheating, not cheating at all. Using a marker, cheating. People will take toothpaste and put it on the vent of their bird because it goes, whoa, what's that? <laughs> 
and it will stand up as straight as can be. Not exactly something we like to see. <laughs> Gluing feathers on or together. Inserting anything into the bird to change its weight. This is all cheating, please don't do it. <laughs> Avoid it. Um, lastly, have an alternative. <laughs> I have seen a beautiful little rooster at the state fair sneeze and all of his feathers magically fall out. <laughs> he was getting ready to molt and picked that day. Have an alternative bird. Um, that does mean it needs to get PT tested in advance and things of that nature, yes? So we're thinking that, is like, mm -hmm. are you allowed to bring one with you as backup then? Absolutely, okay. but it has to be PT tested. Okay, so like say like she's got one she's picked out, we can have two but have one for show bring them together you get them both tested get them well tested well and it's usually the next thing too guys if you're showing broilers or layers i'm not making a final decision until the day before the show so why not bring my top 10 birds get them all tested get them all eligible and then make your decision before the fair when you know they are the most consistent so yes <laughs> and there are some substitutions we will allow. hey guys Broilers. Here's a couple tricks I have on broilers. What bird or what? Sorry, I just gave away the answer. The state fair. There's a special broiler contest. The winner generally receives about ten thousand dollars during the breed of our breed champion sales. It is a. You know how many kids compete in this this year? We have thirty entries. That's it. Thirty entries in the broiler contest for the state fair. It is the highest payment per pound of bird on the champion row. The 20 hours of light and four hours of darkness tends to be that kind of right combination of broilers. You're maximizing their daylight consumption, but you're giving them enough time to get that rest that they need. 20 hours of light, four hours of darkness. Uh, timers are your best friend. Make sure the food is elevated with broilers. Broilers are judged on their meat not their fat. A fat bird sits there, eats and poops. A muscular bird has to get up to do it. You also should move them around. Get in there and make those broilers walk so that you're getting muscle, not fat. Um, are feet important when it comes to broilers? Marcy, shaking her head. They used to not be. Guess what, guys? Broilers used to Feet didn't matter on broilers. However, if you go to the store now, chicken feet at the store are more expensive than chicken thighs. Chicken feet are now a commodity. Before they were a waste product. Now they're something used in consumption. Because of that, the market has changed, the demand has changed. Didn't matter what feet looked like before. It matters now what those feet look like. So keeping up with current trends is just really important. Layers. Basically, again, with layers, try to make sure all your birds are laying. Or, you know, they're either all laying or they're all not laying. But get them in sync, preferably laying, because they're being judged on their productivity. How do you tell if a bird's laying? Well, <laughs> do you want to well, no, no. <laughs> You can tell if a bird is laying. She's, she's over me now, guys. She's like, I was good for a little bit. Um, okay, we all know the egg comes out the back end of the bird. Yeah. It has bones. The end of that keel bone is basically down here, and then she's got hip bones right here. Narrow, a narrow triangle like this, eggs don't come through it. That's a pullet. These eggs, these hip bones will widen here, and that bone will drop, this keel bone will drop down from her hips, making a bigger triangle. A bird that's laying, I can get my whole hand above this <coughs> bone and below her hip bones, or I can get three fingers between her hip bones this way. She's opened up enough to pass eggs, is really what it is. Get your hands on your birds. That's how you're going to tell if they're laying or not. Um, again, layers are leaner. They are not going to be as heavy as a broiler um, because they're putting their, I know, um, they're putting their production into eggs. And again, uniformity is, is more important. Guess what? You got a bird that's a slightly different color, but they're like perfect build together. Go with it. The judge clearly sees one's maybe a little bit different color. That's not the end of the world. Showing different breeds, now nah, we'll do that. All other classes. Trios. Trios are something we don't see much in showing anymore. Trio is one cock and two bird or two hens. 
50% is on the cock, 50% is on the two girls, which is 25% each. The females should be as consistent with each other as possible. When we have identical birds, and I kind of mentioned this earlier when it comes to extremes, if we've got two identical birds, the large fowl, larger one will generally pull ahead, and bantams, the smaller one will pull ahead. Poultry is kind of tending to be more towards extremes. Any questions on that? Question, yes. Question. Mm -hmm. I have a white So with the Hopkins birds, you guys weren't here for that part, were you? You were? Okay. They know. Oh, they can, okay, I wasn't sure. Okay. I can, I'll do, I'll show you how to do that afterwards, okay? We'll go back and do another one. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Can silkies, white silkies be in sunlight? They'll be to turn yellow. So, and you can't <laughs> wash it off. That's the one thing about that is really, they can be in some sunlight, guys. I'm not saying, it needs to be stuck inside all the time, but just know it will yellow the bird. Yes. You have a silky that's smaller, mm -hmm. like much smaller than our others. Um, is that like okay to still show that? Absolutely. Make sure it's still within the standard. Okay. So there is a weight standard and a height standard. So as long as it's still within that category, and there's a plus or minus 10% when it comes to that, um, make sure it's still within the standard, but smaller is better kind of closer to those extremes. But again, um, there's still the scale we talked about in the very beginning. I mean, that's still important to size as a part of that. So sometimes when I refer to things like that, guys, I'm only referring to a specific aspect. Okay, hey, Polk County kids, you gotta be quiet on this. <laughs> hey, showmanship, this that's is hurt. not really that important. The bird is important, but it's a very small portion of your score. Showmanship is you talking about what you know about poultry. I like to use this as an example of what not to do. Who can tell me what's wrong with this? Come on. That's not a Brahma. Oh, hang on. Of course, yeah, might be. <laughs> not a Brahma. He said, I did. Not a Brahma. If you're talking about a breed, make sure you got the right breed, guys. That's a coach. Same class, it's still an Asiatic not a Brahma. And the fact that somebody actually put this on their blog just made me laugh. <laughs> Showmanship is the context where the youth will be given an opportunity to demonstrate their working knowledge of poultry, their ability to carry and examine before a judge. Um, this is an activity where 4-Hers are evaluated, not their birds. The girl that won state fair two, three years ago on showmanship for her age group had a duck that had more DQs than you can imagine. Oh, yes. Okay, sorry, I recorded you, I forgot that. <laughs> I was like, you're still in the head. I had tweaked this one and I forgot. FYI, this presentation is actually available on 4-H. So, um, let's do this. Sorry guys, technical difficulties. So, the things you are being judged on are your poise, including your appearance. That just means you need to be tidy. Don't be slobbing how you handle the bird, your knowledge of the bird, and your ability to answer the judge's questions for you. Um, so, poise is how you handle a bird. She's tired, guys, I'm tired. Come on, I'm tired. She's like, I have had enough. So basically, if your bird's struggling, it still means that you can keep that bird under control. So you might have to stop for a second and kind of reposition, which is okay. But when it comes to actually physically showing your bird, you have questions? Okay, we start with that showmanship hole, which means again, I have her heel, this breastbone right here going this way in my palm. I've got my middle fingers generally between her legs above her knees. Her bone is sitting on the palm of my hand. And if she's flapping, I can take these outside fingers and hold her wings. This doesn't happen overnight. You have to practice. Walk around your yard holding this bird. That's fine, guys. Get the bird under control. We get to go knowledge of your bird and ability to answer questions. So, oops, I'm breaking my presentation. There we go. Be confident when you are talking about your bird. What you generally start is introducing your bird. Your judge doesn't care that this is fluffy and fluffy with bottom crack fly. Your, your judge cares what breed, 
age, color, gender, your bird is. Introduce your bird that way. You generally start a showmanship presentation with going over the parts of the bird. Guess what, guys? A lot of the parts are the same, especially for you younger guys starting out. What's this? It's a beak. What's this round thing here? Same as yours. What's this hole in her face? Nostril. You have these parts, guys. Well, you don't have all the parts. We don't have wings. Um, but there's a lot of these parts. You know this is her leg, and this is her toes, and this is her nail. You know this is her wing, and her back, and her tail. You can talk about a lot of things, even starting young. Older kids, make sure you know some of the technical terms, like nictitating membrane. You know, know the parts of the beak. Maybe your upper mandible, your lower mandible. Everybody should know what type of comb their bird has and if their bird has the right comb for their species. Don't show a Brahma with a straight comb and say, oh, Brahma's have peak combs. Judge is going to be like, well, what's that on there? And you're like, I don't know. Know the combs. Um, when we show a bird, we keep the head towards ourselves. Okay, we've got control over this bird. We're going to start with the head. We can hold the bird out. We can turn the bird. We can show the bird both sides of the, 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 bird, the, bird, the head. I was a little bit looser. Certain states have very specific requirements. We're a little bit more showcase the bird. You're then going to show the back of the bird. You will show the down of the bird. So basically you're showing the underneath the coat. You can then demonstrate each wing. Note, I am right-handed. So this is my Vanna white hand. And then my left hand is holding the bird but I can demonstrate how to hold that bird. When they ask to see the legs or the, or the breast of the bird, the bird goes upside down. Now the judge can see the vent, the legs, and the breast of that bird all together, okay? Avoid petting your bird. I get, these are pets, guys. I pet my birds all the time. You can watch me do it up here. Try not to pet your bird during this show. Know the history of your breed. Know what your breed does. Have a little presentation. Okay, but also be ready for the judge to ask questions. What's the average temperature of the bird? Doesn't matter which breed you have, you should know that. What's the temperature? Not quite. <laughs> That's a chili bird. It's 100, it's like around 104. How many days does it take for a chicken egg to hatch? 22. 21. 21 days. Yeah. Um, what color is your bird? That one's red. That's, that's what I call it red too. <laughs> so you understand the questions, guys. You know what else they can also ask? What's the, what's the, what city is the county seat of your county? What? What do the four H's stand for in four H? Okay, good job, guys. But I'm saying it's while it's a lot about poultry, sometimes there's some tiebreakers in there. What was it? There was one they were telling was a cattle one where some yes oh it's a better number so still so know know some general information about your birds really guys it's really what it is don't just know that i have a brahma and brahma's asiatic understand the history of the asiatic breed what other birds are in the asiatic breed what are the disqualifications for an asiatic bird so again you are judged on this but here's one magic trick 20% of your entire score is how you take the bird out of the cage and put it back in. There is only one right way. Head first, head first out, head first in. Head first out, head first in. The funny thing about judges is they love to watch kids doing showmanship and then literally parents walk in and like just grab the bird and pull it out, <laughs> you know, legs first or something. We do that so we don't damage feathers. When we're pulling the bird this way, there is nothing that is going to get caught on this Yay. bird. If we've got her going backwards, suddenly she gets a wing caught or damaged. It's always head out, head in. The best way to do this is pretend there's a cage here. I'm going to take my right hand and I'm going to gently press my bird up to the side of the cage. At that point, I can input, take my left hand put under her and get a nice secure hold before I take her out of the cage and then I'm ready for demonstration, okay? That's the way to do it. Strong hand, 
gently hold the bird against the side of the cage. Your weaker hand, which you hold the bird with, gets the bird secured and remove it. Is it possible for a judge to line up all their showmanship kids and say, pass the bird to the right? Absolutely. We don't we see do it very often. Animals, animals. Yeah. <laughs> we generally don't do it with chickens, but it can be done. Um, so again, some other things real quick I can share. Even though you might not be talking about to the judge, you are being judged. We never turn our back to the judge, just like in the show ring. If that judge is over there, I'm facing him or them. I'm always facing that judge. Even when I am putting my bird in this cage, I'm not putting my back to the judge. I am stepping away, I'm doing what I need. If you're struggling with something like a cage door that keeps closing, you can ask the judge for help. Can you hold this for me while I do this? That's absolutely okay. The judge would rather have you ask for help for something like that than watch you struggle. Um, if you have to pass a bird, birds are always passed head first. So that way it's coming to the person the way they're going to end up holding it. <laughs> you need to speak clearly and loudly. Sometimes we have these really tall judges, so you need to talk up. Um, practice it, guys. Practice with your friends, with your parents. Practice in your mind. It's something you can't just wing, literally. You need to practice it. You need to act happy to be there, okay? The judge, the more excited you are to talk about that chicken, the more excited the judge is gonna be there to listen to you do it. So just be aware. Um, again, know the basics. Um, one thing I highly recommend is putting together a little packet of information. Um, the scorecards are available when it comes to showmanship judging. There's actually a section in 4-H about that. Yep. And then I dump everything. The standard of perfection lists all the parts of the bird, all the comb types. This is also available online or that website I, or that Facebook page I showed you in the beginning, Polk County Poultry. The parts of fluff, it's all on there for you guys to print out and learn. So just be aware, the info's there. It's just you <laughs> um, Again, make sure you also introduce yourself. I forgot to mention that. My name is Jordan Haggard. I'm with the North, North Polk Poultry Peaks. This is my bird. She is a red leghorn hen. She's approximately three years old. Red leghorns, sorry, red leghorns are part of the um, Mediterranean class, aren't they? Oh, there you go. See, I'm not a judge, guys. <laughs> um, remember to thank your judge, guys. Judges are spending their entire day. Judges are hard to find. So they're probably doing multiple shows a week if they're a good judge. They are spending so much of the time, and we're really not paying them a whole lot. It may seem like a lot, but I mean, if you really break it down by all the work they have to do, how long does a judge have to apprentice for? Five years. Five years is what a judge has to apprentice for before they are considered an APA judge. So they have put a lot of work into that. But yeah, just a couple things real quick. Um, combs, it's important to know the nine combs. Parts of the bird. Um, I'm gonna give you her back. <laughs> My own so see guys, I'm kinda passing her the bird at first so she can get that secure hold. But I'm not letting go until she's got a hold of her. So parts of the bird. Um, again, I have all of that available on the Facebook page. And it's nice because the way it's done, you can actually take it out, fold it upside down, and use it as a study guide. Uh, parts of the wing, too, nine parts of the wing, it's important to learn those. Colors of the feet, make sure it's the right color for your bird. And make sure you register showmanship is still something you have to register for in advance. Okay, guys. I have shared with you what I find beneficial. What questions, if any, do you have for me about any of the topics we discussed? Okay, so for showmanship, you're ranked for county showmanship. So, like, I'm a senior in chicken showmanship in Polk County. Mm -hmm. Am I back to junior if I go to state fair? Oh, for state fair? Yeah. State fair is based just off your age group since you're starting out. Your county ranking for showmanship does not matter for state fair. Okay. You'd be an intermediate. That's yeah, for age. Oh, yes. Yeah, so so, yes, good question. Anyway, you meant. Yeah. Is showmanship in person this year? No. Yes. Um, it is. One thing I will mention to you guys, this is my, okay, so now here's my general plea. 
I am the superintendent for the state fair. I am taking over for somebody that's done it for like 20 something years and he was awesome. Last year we had two people that showed up to help set up 400 pages. I need help. If you have time and honestly follow that Polk County poultry, I don't ever post. Um, I will put when we have times there that I need help. I appreciate help. In addition to not just set up, if people are interested in learning, if 4 Hers want to learn more about showing and maybe they're not, you know, able to show, I can still use help when it comes to things like possibly croaking, which means you follow a judge around and get to learn with them. Um, I also, you know, registration, basically volunteers are really what we need. Um, so just, I will put that out there. If you can help, I appreciate it. If you can't, I totally understand as well, but we need volunteers. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes. Is there any incentives for that, like maybe fair tickets? The fair does. So if you are a volunteer the day of the show, there is the incentive of a free parking pass and a fair pass. But please understand the day of the show starts at 7 a.m. and ends around 3. So you're welcome to stay after that. And lunch is provided for the volunteers. If it's, and this is state fair that I'm referring to. Yes. Um, but understand, it's very hard to volunteer if you also have a person participating in the show. So a, a parent trying to multitask doesn't work well. But a great, and one parent's doing that and one parent's volunteering works fantastic. So yes, there is that type of incentive. Um, if you are interested, uh, you can take my, my, put my number back up. Um, just email me or anything like that. So there is that. For a cage setup, there is no incentive whatsoever. And when, when is when do you guys set up for this? Is it Sunday? Sunday? The Sunday before. It's before. Yeah, it's before. Uh, and then, so there, we set up cages, and the same cages are used to be used by pigeons, but they got away with the pigeon show, and now the rabbits. So we set up rabbits tear down. It's kind of how it works. Um, I have a feeling the state fair is going to be big this year. With the I, number of animals? With the number of animals. Yeah. From what I'm seeing, I have a suspicion it's going, and even then, last year, guys, we still had 300 and something birds at the state fair. No. I mean, it was still a big show. Um, here's my information. Um, so the cage setup is Sunday. It's generally the Sunday before the, so like it's Thursday is the show. Uh, Sunday, Sunday before is when you do cage setup. So the housing you were talking about where you would need a separate parent would be the clerking? Would be, well, I've got, yes, a clerking and ribbon handout and just checking in. Is she showing? I'm fine. Um, the clerks, I've got two judges in training that are clerking, but I can still put a 4 -H -er with them to hand out ribbons and still get the information. Um, so, not for first year. No. <laughs> no. Like I, it's, yeah, it's, It'd be a long, a long day. It's a long day. And unfortunately, guys, the poultry princess or the poultry queen went away, but we're actually looking at bringing back something like a poultry ambassador which is actually something really cool that the state might be doing in a year or two. It takes a while to organize these things. It does. It really does. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Yes. Um, what was it? Did you say that you have to have the birds tested for before you show them? Yes, good question. So it has not been tested for several years, which is Pullerum typhoid. It's called a PT test. Pullerum typhoid is a highly contagious catastrophic disease that was essentially eradicated by testing in the 50s. It's actually considered the most successful program in agricultural. Um, however, we still test. Iowa has not had a positive test since 1970, but is a blood test that is done by a specific tester. Um, you can actually go to the Iowa Poultry Association and they will have a list of testers in your area. Um, also, many counties throw different events. Um, like our county is doing testing two different mornings, one in June, one in July. It's a drive up testing. Um, all of our information, again, is on that, uh, our Facebook page and then in the county. Wait, it's going to yes. The test yes. needs yes. to be within 90 days of the show. Right. So we can do it as early as now. Yes, but you've got to find somebody to do it, which right. is like the challenge. The challenge. I'll be honest, guys, even though I'm a tester, I can't go to every single farm and test every single kid. So I don't. I, I can't do it. I do drive up clinics so I can get as many kids as I can. What is that? What was that? What is your cost? Depends on your county. Um, our county charge is a dollar. It's a dollar per test. Um, our county does things so slightly differently that our county requires birds to have identification bands so that we can track them. Um, if you test in the county, we will ban the birds for you. 
if you have a private tester there, you can ban them yourself. Wing bands, I love wing bands, guys. That's another whole thing. Questions? Okay. Questions? How long does it take to test these students? Um, it takes two minutes. Okay. Well, it takes two minutes to get a result. <laughs> so, yeah. But between banding, getting the blood drawn, on, it takes five, five, six, so five six, if you so wanted to test, I think 10 birds is the max allowed, right? At, the, at the testing uh, site. Well, that's no. no can for, bring, you can bring all the birds you want for the testing yeah, site. We ask you to schedule a time okay. if it's more than 10, so I can not have all my people with the water birds show up at once. Sure. That, and that's for our county. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> you know. Sorry, question. Yes. Do they have to be banned in order to show? In Polk County, they do for our county fair. The state fair does not require it. Right. It's, I like banding. I prefer I prefer a wing band. That's what I do for all my birds. It's a it's a small metal clip that goes in the webbing of the bird's wing. You can't see it at all, but it's a permanent band, and I can track genetics of a bird. I never get confused on who's. Thanks for picking me today, guys. I'm excited. <laughs> I was all like, nobody's gonna come, and it's gonna be awful. <laughs>